these are some of the resources we have available. Um, the first two are from the American Chemical Society. We do produce textbooks, one for high school students, secondary students, and one for non-science majors uh, who are uh, in college. And both of them have a very strong emphasis on green chemistry and sustainability. The Journal of Chemical Education is a great resource. There are, uh, there's a feature called Topics in Green Chemistry, and you can often find labs there or classroom exercises. Uh, Jim Hutchison and Ken Doxey, uh, Ken was at the conference this week, um, have a green organic chemistry laboratory manual that produce, uh, it, um, illustrates green chemistry, some very nice ex experiments in, in the lab. And also at Oregon, Oregon has done a lot of really good work. They have a database. Uh, again, a lot of experiments in there, but also other types of educational resources. And they have an edu green chemistry education network to try to build the community and connect people with one another, again, to share ideas and best practices. Chemistry in Context, I mentioned, is the name of our textbook, but it's more than that. It's our philosophy. You really need to present chemistry in the context of, of global issues, as well as things that are relevant to students' daily lives. We, we have a magazine for high school students called Chem Matters, and it says demystifying everyday chemistry. And a lot, a lot of the articles are focused on things that you know high school kids like. It's on sports. It's on hair and makeup. It's on physical fitness. Uh, it's on food. Um, so those are the things. There's a lot of chemistry in those things, and I think making those connections is very important. When you think about teaching some of these topics, I mean, just look at what you teach or maybe what you're going to teach in the future in terms of standard topics in general in organic chemistry. In general chemistry, everybody teaches energy, okay? Enthalpy, entropy, but why not expand that? As long as you're talking about energy, why not talk about different energy sources? Why not talk about renewable energy sources? You know, that makes that connection far more so than just memorizing a bunch of equations. Um, reaction rates, stratospheric ozone depletion is a terrific example for demonstrating reaction rates. And then it brings in the whole CFCs and the ozone depletion and tropospheric versus stratospheric ozone. I mean, there's lots of connections that can be made there. In organic chemistry, at least in the United States, most students in organic chemistry are going on in the health professions, or think they're going on in the health professions. Not everybody gets into medical school. And so, just as I showed earlier, there are some really good pharmaceutical examples which are of strong interest to the students in organic chemistry. So there's some pretty easy ways of doing this, which I didn't realize till I did that fellowship at EPA, and I was still teaching at Trinity, and I would take the examples I was re reviewing for the Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Awards and just put them into, the, into my lectures on organic chemistry because they were relevant and they gave students sort of that green chemistry concept. So it's, you don't have to stick with the same reactions we've been using for the last 150 years. <laughs> Another thing that I often get asked by students is, how green is green? I mean, how do you, you can't look at a reaction or a product and go, oh, that's green. You don't know. I mean, you really need to do a full life cycle assessment to know that. Most people aren't going to do a full life cycle assessment. Um, but oftentimes, you're comparing. Here's how it used to be done. Here's how we're doing it now. So you can compare certain aspects of that. And some of these, you know, atom economy, you know, how efficiently are the atoms in the starting material getting into the product? E factor, how much waste are you producing per kilogram of product that you're forming? But you have to keep in mind that that's just a tiny piece of it because you don't know the nature of that waste. E factor tells you nothing about whether that's hazardous waste or you're producing a lot of water, okay? It's just waste. How much energy are you using? What solvents you're using? <coughs> what type of waste and how much of it? So these are all things, again, that is, are pretty much totally absent from the curriculum that we need to start introducing so people have a better concept, especially students, about how do we characterize this. And keep in mind the green chemistry, even though we use the term green chemistry or green engineering, this goes way beyond chemistry. All of the issues associated with sustainability are going to require multiple disciplines to contribute. You know, medicine, law, business, marketing, I talk about the economics already. All of these have a role to play. And marketing, 
most of the claims for green products are misleading or false. There have been studies on this. 99% of them are false or misleading. So it's one of the things we have to be very careful about, that there really is no such thing as green chemistry, it's greener chemistry. And we have to be able to say, in what way is it greener than what we were doing before. But I really think green chemistry is our discipline's unique contribution to sustainability. The other disciplines don't make stuff the way chemists do. And that's where we can really have a huge impact. I mentioned outreach before. This is my boss, the executive director of the American Chemical Society, Madeline Jacobs, with the mole. He's our mascot. You can see, you know, chemistry mole. Uh, people thought he was the science dog. I was very offended by that. Um, but, you know, having sort of a fun character out there, this was the USA Science and Engineering Festival, which was held on the National Mall in Washington for the first time two years ago. The Park Service estimates there were half a million people who came through over two days. You can have a huge impact. And we had our table set up with, we were doing hands-on experiments, but we also had information on green chemistry. So science festivals are one way. Most countries, most chemical societies have a National Chemistry Week or a National Chemistry Day. Uh, at ACS, we have Chemists Celebrate Earth Day. Again, emphasizing how chemistry contributes to solving global challenges, not causing global challenges. Science cafes, this is a new movement where you bring, you know, people come to a, a coffee house or even better, a wine bar in the evening and you have a short talk about science and then most of the time is spent answering questions and answers in science museums. So outreach, informal education is another way. I think one of the nice things about green chemistry is its ability to teach creativity teaching chemistry as a creative science. Too often chemistry is taught as a collection of facts to be memorized. And that's why students often hate chemistry, because they think it's about memorization. Uh, when I would teach my non-majors, they would come in the first day and say, do we have to memorize the periodic table? I said, it's hanging on the wall. Why would you memorize something that's hanging on the wall? I said, I want you to know how to use the periodic table. I don't want you to memorize it. So if we can get more of that critical thinking and creative thinking. Chemists are molecular designers. Um, one uh, green chemist, Ishvan Horvath, was at a cocktail party one time. And everybody he meets is like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an interior designer, or I'm an artistic designer. And as soon as he said, I'm a chemist, they would flee in terror. So he began thinking about this, and then when people came up, he began saying, oh, I'm a molecular designer. <gasps> really? Tell me what you do. I mean, it's amazing. We just need to portray ourselves a little bit differently. So we're molecular designers, and our ability to design molecules really does have a huge impact on human health and the environment. Creativity, I found this article, this was from Newsweek a couple, weeks, a couple years ago. IQ scores are rising, but our creativity quotient is declining. We're less creative people now. And this is happening at the same time that chief executive officers of big companies have said that creativity is the number one skill for leadership. So we're going in the wrong direction at the time when we need to be more creative than ever before. And I think this is where green chemistry and sustainability really come in. And this quote by John Carberry I think is great. Adding an environmental or sustainability layer over research is not a constraint on creativity, but is a challenge to creativity. It is, takes much more creativity to produce a chemical product in a way that's better for human health and the environment than to do the heat beaten treat I mentioned earlier. So this really provides an opportunity for chemists to be more creative than, than, than ever before and really making that connection between green chemistry and sustainability. Many of the examples I've given you are from the US because of course that's what I'm familiar with. But I want to point out there's terrific work going on around the world and especially here in Brazil. And I, just from the conference you can see how much energy there is behind green chemistry and sustainability in Brazil right now. And uh, this, this has to become the way that we do chemistry in the future. Otherwise, it's simply not going to be sustainable. I don't want to leave out industry in this, by the way. I think industry has a big role to play. 
Um, when they're advertising for positions, they need to start putting in that they want to hire people who have a background in green chemistry and sustainability, because that's also going to drive the curriculum. They need to provide more internships for students to come in and learn about what companies are doing in terms of green chemistry and sustainability. And they should be providing speakers who can go out and talk to colleges and universities and the general public about their efforts in green chemistry and sustainability. Again, that's going to help the general public understand that the chemical industry is not the enemy, but we're really trying to make the products that they want in a way that's better for human health and the environment. I like to think we're embarking on the third green revolution. First one was agriculture. You know, we're able to feed far more people now using far less land because of fertilizers and pesticides. I know there's problems with fertilizers and pesticides, but that's also an area of active research in green chemistry. I think we're in the second green revolution now where green is used way too much. Uh, you, the, you may have heard the term greenwashing, where everything's sort of painted with an environmental brush. And it's just not accurate. I mean, a couple years ago in the US, they were advertising green TV shows. Seriously? That just makes no sense. Um, so I, we're overusing the term green at this point. But I like to think we're moving into the third green revolution, which is an education. Um, developing courses that really reflect the current practice of chemistry and not how it was done 150 years ago, with sustainability as a driver and connecting the science to the social issues so that students have that understanding of how it all fits together. And finally, I see, th from my standpoint, I see there are three real goals for education for sustainability. First, develop well-informed global citizens. Everybody has a role to play in sustainability, and people are going to understand it a lot better if we start early on in educating them. Secondly, we do need to pr develop chemists and engineers who know how to implement green chemistry so that we can produce better products and processes. And then finally, I think it's education for sustainability is critically important in creating this awareness of the role of science and technology in solving global challenges rather than creating global challenges. So with that, I'd like to first of all thank you all for your kind attention. I also want to thank, again, everybody here for the wonderful hospitality. I've just really had a wonderful time here in Brazil. I, I go home tomorrow night. Uh, so I've really appreciated the time, uh, not just at the Congress, but also the time here in Sao Carlos. And I'd be happy to take any questions or um, any comments that you have. And I thank you again. Mm -hmm.